All right, how's everybody doing? Um, in this video, I'm going to be talking about some of the moral problems related to uh, whistleblowing, and this comes from uh, Michael Davis's article um, on various paradoxes of whistleblowing, and it's it's paradoxes related to what's known as the standard theory of whistleblowing. So I'll be going over um, the standard theory of whistleblowing and then the various paradoxes that uh, arise out of it. Okay, now if you're not familiar with the terminology of whistleblowing, obviously uh, what is who and who is not a whistleblower uh, has been all the rage in the news because of uh, the impeachment inquiry and things like that and uh, whistleblower protection laws and all of that. But um, when we're talking about whistleblowing, we're talking something about something very specific. Um, which is internal to an organization or a corporation. So uh, whistleblowing occurs when an employee or former employee uh, informs the public about immoral or illegal behavior. So um, an investigative journalist, for example, who um, acquires some information through investigation or through interviews about moral wrongdoing or illegal activity taking place within an organization um, or corporation who then you know writes a story uh, and then reveals this information to the public that individual would not be a whistleblower so um, with investigative journalism what we have are third parties disclosing information um, with whistleblowing in order for whistleblowing to occur, it needs to be an individual who is a voluntary member of an organization or corporation. So what is happening with whistleblowing is the would-be whistleblower or the employee is disclosing information, privileged information, um, that they've largely been trusted with not to disclose. And they are revealing that to the public uh, for a moral reason or... Uh, to set the record straight, something like that. Okay. Now, since the practice of whistleblowing does involve um, activities and considerations which uh, in other circumstances might be seen as grossly immoral, uh, that is why whistleblowing requires moral justification. So, um, and Michael Davis talks about, you know, ways that we can understand. Uh, uh, an act or an activity being morally justified. Um, but in the important sense here, usually when an activity or an act needs to be justified, it's it's because we understand that generally that kind of activity is wrong. So I don't need to justify eating breakfast. I, you know, I typically, unless I'm eating somebody else's food, um, we understand that it's permissible to eat breakfast. I don't need to provide a moral reason for eating breakfast. But um, things like lying and, and that, uh, if I'm going to tell a lie, I have to be able of justifying the lie. I, I recognize in the justification of the lie that lying is typically seen as morally wrong. So um, if an activity like this requires moral justification, that gives us reason to believe that it's prima facie wrong. It's generally wrong, but under certain sets of circumstances, um, something which in most circumstances would be wrong might actually be morally justified or even morally required. Okay, so I won't spend too much time on this, but there are a couple of specific reasons in particular um, that in normal circumstances, what takes place with whistleblowing would be seen as morally wrong. Um, the first involves breach of trust. Um, and this can be understood in terms of both disclosing information that an individual was trusted with, uh, but this also cuts at the heart of employee loyalty. So um, when you are hired on as a voluntary member of an organization or a corporation, you are agreeing to use discretion uh, with information that um, you are provided with. Um, and there is also something to be said about being loyal to the organization or corporation of which you are a member. I mean, even if you're loyal to an organization or a corporation for purely selfish reasons, um, you are still 
signing on to a certain agreement to be loyal to that organization or corporation or to do what is best for the organization or the corporation um, when you are a voluntary member of it. Now, um, to the extent that whistleblowing can be very costly to the organization or the corporation that is being reported on, you know, that the whistle is being blown on, um, if whistleblowing runs the risk of doing serious damage to the organization or corporation's overall reputation or profit margin and things like that, then through the act of whistleblowing, you as an employee of the organization are engaging in activity which would be potentially potentially harmful to the organization. Um, now, but obviously when you're hired on, as an employee, you are expected to not do things that are going to harm the organization, cut into the profit margin, potentially make the organization or corporation go out of business or go bankrupt. Um, as a loyal employee, that is what you are supposed to do. But since you've been trusted to be a loyal employee, to the extent that any activity which would potentially make your organization or corporation go out of business, you know, that would not only be bad for the organization, it would be bad for you. Whistleblowing does involve this breach of trust here. Now, and secondly, obviously, um, there's a disclosure of privileged information. So the information that the whistleblowing is releasing to the public, it needs to be the kind of information that they themselves um, have a sort of a position of authority over. It has to be the case that the employee is trusted with that information or it's the kind of information that they've been entrusted with just through the normal mechanisms of how the organization is run. So for example, um, if I'm a member of the janitorial staff at an organization and I sneak into um, you know, a vice president's office or something like that, and I start thumbing through the files and things. Um, this technically would be problematic because I'm disclosing information that I'm not privy to as a member of the organization. So as a member of the janitorial staff, um, it is not my place largely to disclose this information because it's not information that I've been made aware of just through normal exchange of information in the organization at all. So I'm not entrusted with this information. I actually went morally out of bounds by breaking into the vice president's office to acquire this information. So in order for whistleblowing to be justified, it needs to be the case that it's information that the individual becomes aware of, not through any sort of dishonest or sneaky tactics. Um, it's information that they themselves sort of have jurisdiction over are, or are entrusted uh, to you know, use discretion with. But obviously, if I'm a member of, a, of the janitorial staff, uh, that would not be the case. I'm not privy to this information. It is not my place um, you know, to, to uh, go through hoops of going you know, skipping basic protocol and, and things like that, okay? Now, so because of that, this is where we come to what um, Davis calls the standard theory of whistleblowing, okay? Now, so the standard theory of whistleblowing lays out the conditions which need, um, uh, lays out the conditions which need to obtain one in order for whistleblowing to be morally justified, but more importantly, for whistleblowing um, to be morally required. So it's one thing to say that it's permissible to blow the whistle on one's organization or corporation, but it's quite another thing to say that there are circumstances where it's morally required. So something may not be uh, required and still be justified, but in order for something to be morally required, it first needs to meet the requirements for justification. So if the justification um, conditions are not met, then clearly the requirement conditions are not met. But the justification conditions can be met without the requirement conditions uh, uh, being met. Okay. Now, so whistleblowing, first of all, is justified, morally justified when, first of all, 
uh, the organization to which the employee or former employee belongs will do considerable harm to the public. So the organization or corporation through their practices or products will uh, inevitably do some kind of considerable harm to the public. This could be physical harm. It could even be psychological harm. Okay. Now, secondly, the employee needs to report the potential threat of harm, of serious harm, to their immediate supervisor in the organization. So Michael Davis um, includes point two and three as one point, but they're kind of separate. So that's why I've divided them up here. So the first step, if an employee of an organization somehow is made aware um, that the organization of which they're a member or uh, a former organization of which they were a member, um, is going to be engaged in activities which will cause considerable harm to the public, either through their acts or through their products. Um, first, they need to go to their immediate supervisor and report it. Okay. Now, in order to move on further in the process, this needs to be the case. So, as a result of doing so, uh, the employee concludes that the immediate supervisor will not do anything effective to mitigate the harm. So, um, the employee here needs to have good reason to believe that even though they've reported the potential threat of harm to their immediate supervisor, they have to have good reason to believe that the immediate supervisor themselves is not going to be doing anything effective. So um, they have to have good reason to believe that the immediate supervisor will not do anything effective to mitigate the harm or, or prevent the, the threat of harm in order to go to the next level, to go above their immediate supervisor's head, as it were. Okay, so for example, um, in the instance fairly recently where, you know, the Navy captain sent out a, a blast email about, um, you know, his the crew members on his ship coming down with COVID, um, one of the reasons why people were saying it, he was justifiably terminated from his position was that he did not follow the standard protocol about how these kinds of things are done. So um, instead of immediately going to his immediate supervisor, who I believe was a, a rear admiral, um, this Navy captain, you know, sent out a blast email uh, to people that were even higher up there. So kind of ignored sort of the standard organization protocol, which typically uh, takes place in the Navy. And then that information was released to the public. Now, part of the reason why um, typically with standard protocol in an organizational context, why we have supervisors and why we sort of have a chain of command um, is to avoid the potential risk to the organization. So if I make my immediate supervisor aware of uh, illegal activity or immoral activity, which is going to cause considerable harm to the public, um, if this problem can be handled internally, then obviously it would be best to handle it internally because then the risks about this information being uh, disclosed to the public and then doing considerable harm to our organization or losing our public image, um, if it can be handled internally, obviously we're mitigating those risks, right? We're, we're not having to worry about potential uh, blowback that might happen with our organization. So again, given the substantial risk to the organization that would likely happen by disclosing this information to the public. Um, going above your supervisor's head without talking to your immediate supervisor or superior first about this, this is why following through with the protocol and going through the chain of command or the organizational hierarchy, that's why this is uh, morally important in an organizational context, okay? So those are reasons why um, whistleblowing is morally justified. Okay, now, but furthermore, um, the employee needs to have exhausted all reasonable internal procedures within the organization. So clearly going to the immediate superior or supervisor is one thing, but then whatever other kinds of protocols are in place or procedures are in place other than going to an immediate supervisor, um, in order for whistleblowing to be justified, all of those things need to be exhausted. Um, if the employee has not exhausted 
all reasonable internal procedures or protocols for dealing with this issue other than disclosing it to the public, um, then whistleblowing is not justified. There's other things that the employee could have done other than re releasing this information to the public. So if they haven't done that, whistleblowing would not be justified, right? Okay, now whistleblowing is morally required when these further conditions are met. So in order for it to be required, all four of those justification conditions need to be met. And then there's two other conditions that need to be met as well. So first of all, there has to be evidence of the threat of harm that would convince a reasonable, impartial observer. Now, this gets somewhat problematic about, okay, where do we draw the line about what reasonable, uh, impartial observers are? Okay, that's, that's a serious epistemological issue, but basically we can understand a reasonable impartial observer as sort of what we would call an epistemic peer. So if I'm the member of the organization, um, would somebody for all intents and purposes, would somebody who's basically equally rational to me, they don't need to be an insider, they don't need to know all the lingo and all the, you know, the, the, the standard information that goes with the organization, but would a reasonable impartial individual, somebody who just uses common sense rationality equivalent to my own, would they understand um, that there's credible evidence of a potential threat of harm here, right? And then furthermore, there is good reason to believe that revealing the information will likely prevent that threat of harm. So not only does there need to be good evidence that would convince an impartial, reasonable observer of the threat of harm, um, we need to have good reason to believe that by disclosing the information um, itself, by disclosing the information itself, we have a reasonable chance of actually preventing the harm from happening. Okay, so that is what's known as the standard model of whistleblowing. Now, and as Davis points out, this standard model of whistleblowing does have some pretty severe um, inconsistencies or what he calls paradoxes. But so a paradox is just a seeming contradiction. But uh, Davis goes a step further and says, now, and when I call these paradoxes, I just don't mean that um, there's sort of a... a the appearance of inconsistency here. Davis goes so far as to say he thinks the, the standard model here is inconsistent with actual practice. Okay, now, so the first paradox is what we could call uh, the paradox of burden. All right, now it's the paradox of burden because um, through the act of whistleblowing, the would be whistleblower or the employee, it seems that they are taking an undue burden upon themselves. So because they are seen as breaching company trust, violating company loyalty, and disclosing privileged information that they were entrusted with, um, the would-be whistleblower is taking considerable risk to themselves, their livelihood, their family, and the like. So Davis uses the term that it seems that they're going beyond minimal decent Samaritanism to being a full-blown good Samaritan. Now, but when we're talking about what's morally required, it's difficult to see how I could be morally required to assume that grade of risk upon myself as a member of the organization. So through the act of whistleblowing, the would-be whistleblower or the employee is taking considerable private risk uh, their livelihood, their family, you know, their future employment and the like. I mean, a lot of whistleblowers even get death threats. I mean, a lot of them need security details, especially when it comes to governmental whistleblowers and things like this. So it's because we understand how precarious whistleblowing can be for the whistleblower. That is why we have whistleblower protections in place for would-be whistleblowers. Now, but it seems difficult to say that I'm morally required to accept that great of risk upon myself. So again, like we talked about before, um, it seems that if by engaging in activity, 
I'm assuming an equal amount of risk or an equal amount of harm, it doesn't seem that I can be morally required. So I can't be morally required to jump into the lake to save somebody who's drowning if by doing so I would be at equal risk of drowning. So it seems that through whistleblowing, the would-be whistleblower is at least assuming equal risk of the harm that they are trying to prevent. And if that is the case, that would be an undue burden. And if it's an undue burden, it seems that whistleblowing can't be morally required. So if I can't be morally required to assume an undue burden or assume equal risk or harm to myself that I'm trying to prevent, uh, then whistleblowing can't be morally required. But according to the standard theory, it is morally required. Um, you know, to avoid that potential threat of harm or risk, all right? Okay, the second paradox is what we could call the paradox of missing harm. Um, because a lot of time in standard cases of whistleblowing, preventing some considerable harm or there's being a considerable threat of harm isn't always the case.